back. We'll be chatting. We know about spring break. I hope it was good. Um, looking into our class, what's coming up? Check out the syllabus for important dates. Um, we have a quiz coming up in a couple of weeks. So that's on April 18th. That'll be uh, two, what? Not next Thursday, not the week after, but the week after that. So we can, you know, of course, we'll review for that on the Tuesday before the quiz is uh, happening. And I always try to get the review document to you a week in advance so you can review over the weekend if you want. Same type of thing. Questions will come from the cahoots and you know, we'll be reviewing those things uh, in advance. Um, so there's that. On April 25th, the week after, uh, we have our industry news presentation here in class. And since we're such a cozy few, I think it'll probably go okay. But this is mandatory for everybody. Everybody out there who's still in this class, uh, we have to come in on April 25th. Uh, let me give you a brief description of this, but we'll definitely have time to prepare for it and fill you in. Uh, so this is basically uh, a, a short one minute presentation. X marks the spot here. One stands here. Jody gives us a microphone and we pretend that we are industry news reporters, basically. Uh, you have one minute to give us the update on the latest industry development about a company of your choice, basically. And so we sort that out in advance, like uh, maybe a couple of weeks in advance, or we figure out, OK, somebody wants to do Twitter, somebody wants to do Facebook, someone wants to do Google, someone wants to do NBC. So we just get that organized. And then after that, you go out onto Google and search the latest news on them and uh, you know, extract the important facts from that and turn it into a one minute long speech. And uh, it is, it is uh, perfectly permissible to hold your script out and sort of read off the script. That's fine. This is not about your performance. But I would like you to write it as though it is news, as though you, know, you are uh, summarizing everything necessary. So it's not like, hey, yeah, I read this article and it was like, you know, it was all right. It was kind of boring, but they said, you know, what you want to be is like, uh, you know, last week uh, Variety reported that Disney has finally taken over all of the Fox assets. They've laid off, you know, half of the executives from the old Fox and uh, they're now bringing to fruition this merger and et cetera. And you know, so giving the facts and giving them in a kind of straightaway, this is it. I got one minute to tell my story type of thing. So that's that's uh, my hope. Uh, so uh, this uh, starts by just we pick companies. So maybe what you could do right now is to not not right now, but in this next week, is think about what you might like to report on. And uh, you could go to Google already and see if there are any juicy stories out there that you would be interested in picking up. And then you could choose the company based on you know, having already found some interesting information about this. But uh, you know, again, it's, it's wide open in terms of radio companies, television companies, networks, uh, production companies, uh, streaming services which of course is where a lot of the action is right now in terms of huge mergers and things. You can take it at the level of, you know, even performers or out to, you know, these gigantic companies like Disney and, and what they're doing. So uh, it's, it's, it's all good. And the idea is to give us the latest news so we know what's going on and to connect it to some of the stuff that we've been talking about. So, you know, now we would understand why, you know, the kind of uh, conglomeration that we see with Disney buying 20th century, 21st century Fox's assets. You know, now we understand a little bit, like, well, why would that happen? And what's going on? Who are they competing with? You know, and, uh, and and why does that purchase, you know, that multi-billion-dollar buy make sense? You know, so, so you can inject your analysis into it. Uh, typically, you can find that kind of analysis in the news item. You know, so, 
as you research, you'll probably find out everything you need to say. Uh, so give it, give it a look. Uh, and, and I always enjoy it because I always learn something from the uh, presentations. And also, it's fun to see you guys relate what's going on now to stuff that we talked about in the class already. It's, like, it, it's kind of a good demonstration that you're, you know, you're thinking with some of the questions about it. Everybody's pretty on board. So you know, if you have time in the next week, just think about what company you might want to work on. And you know, just Google it and see where, you know, even if you're keeping up with news on a daily basis, some of these industry happenings are so huge that they you know, break into regular news. And you probably know something about them already that you would want to talk about. So. All right, so that's that. And just check it. Trying to do my best. Uh, well, check. OK, so files don't seem to be available on. Uh, well, maybe they are. We'll see how we're doing. But we got we got plenty that we can do. Um, so this week's discussion is about uh, the PBS documentary Generation Like, which is uh, um, it's uh, you know there's been a series by a media theorist and critic named Doug Rushkoff, who's really a terrifically interesting guy. Um, and he's, you know, uh, over the last 20 years done a bunch of documentaries about, you know, the developing media from, uh, you know, the crash of online uh, news operations and uh, this one. Uh, he did another one about um, uh, marketing to kids and stuff. So early, early bits of that were dealing with influencers, things like that. So this one also develops a little further on that, looking at social media, and especially young audiences, like younger, you know, than you guys who are. Uh, by the time that they, you know, this is this was made a few years back, so they're they're probably young adults now themselves. So just just looking in and thinking about, okay, what's this new, this new media platform or series of platforms going to do, to. Uh, you know, the way, the, the culture, the culture of young people, pop culture, consumer culture and stuff this is making a huge difference. We all know it. Uh, this film kind of puts forth some ideas. So uh, I think we could watch some of this uh, before we finish up class today and then finish it off next class, I guess. Okay. Um, and meanwhile, uh, we almost got completely finished with... Um, the uh, examination we were doing of ratings, right? This is a ways back, right? But it was um, one of the better chapters in terms of um, it has detailed information about something that's super important to the industry. And uh, it, um, you know, I mean, compare this to the textbook take on the social media platforms, which I will, you know, um, freely admit is, you know, just real basic, it's a very sketchy, versus this stuff about um, ratings is very in-depth and very, you know, very meaningful for old and new media, right? So um, I propose that after uh, a quick run through, just to try to get this stuff a little bit back into our heads, we do the Kahoot uh, associated with this chapter, I get those questions out before you. Um, uh, on the idea that you know, officially this week we're doing social media, but last uh, last week <laughs> before the break we were, you know, uh, not as not as full filled full of energy as we are this week. So let's let's review this important topic, and then do the kahoot, and then we can get into uh, the social media type stuff. Um, so uh, the importance of ratings, of course, is basically gives us sketchy, uh, well, uh, schematic information about the media audiences that, you know, mostly energy and money is pumped into this because this determines how valuable your advertising is against other media and within your own, you know, uh, medium. Uh, it determines, you know, what station, what show is worthy of more ad dollars than others. 
So that's the major reason for ratings. And then, you know, programmers, of course, refer to ratings and make their choices as to what they leave on the air or take off the air. So there are other, other reasons, and other players that are interested in ratings beyond just setting your advertising rates. But that is uh, the most important thing. Uh, watching the discussions develop online, mostly because there's a lot more students online. Um, I found a lot of students say, hey, I don't watch any of these shows. These ratings are really inaccurate, you know. Um, but just, just to remind everybody that, you know, Nielsen knows very well what audiences they are covering. You know? uh, the fact that you guys as a younger audience don't find yourselves really represented in that is a serious problem for Nielsen, but it still nonetheless doesn't mean that it's inaccurate. It's just the people watching Big Bang Theory are probably 50 years old, you know. And, and you guys probably don't have cable to watch the cable channels that they're, you know, you're taking things a la carte through streaming services on demand. Maybe you're spending much more time with YouTube or other, you know, kind of uh, uh, streaming services than Nielsen is really going to uh, account for, you know, at least not in the top line ratings that, that we linked to in our class. So, just to say that it's accurate, but it doesn't reflect all audiences. In fact, it reflects the narrow demographics that they you know, uh, uh, are actually watching. And, and they do have their eye on every audience, but um, we may not be getting that information. Hey, Kira. Sorry. No, no worries. Uh, cool. So uh, quick, quick review. Going back to the early days of radio, Nielsen Company, which is, you know, it's still, we know about the Nielsen ratings. It was already there with the autometer, which was a mechanical device. They put it into your radio set to see where you were tuning your radio. And this was an improvement on the diary system um, and, you know, the earlier telephone recall stuff in a sense that. Um, Advertisers felt, well, this must be the real stuff because I'm actually seeing like a, 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 a mechanical uh, tracking of what the audience is listening to. It's not just them remembering. Okay. So uh, the way, uh, the way uh, ratings are uh, conducted throughout the country is in what are called DMAs, designated market areas. So these are geographic locations where uh, you know, each, the company is divided into a couple of hundred markets and the ratings are given for each market. So this allows local stations to compete against one another. So if you know, your KTVU, your ad sales teams are watching the ratings in the Bay Area DMA, which includes San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose. You're basically competing against all the stations in that area. Uh, as well as all the other media, the Cron, San Jose, uh, Mercury News, et cetera. Uh, so they all, they all work within the same rough DMA. You know, the, the print media, will call it something a little different, but they overlap in a big way. Um, so that's uh, DMAs are how they chunk out the country in terms of, of uh, geographic markets which is cool for old media, but for new media, like online media, your geographic location doesn't really matter much, right? Because it's, it's global, basically. So this is for broadcast media. Um, on a national level, Nielsen conducts what they call sweeps, which are four times a year. They will survey not just those local DMAs, but they also have a national panel of a couple of thousand, thousand households, which is very expensive for them. Uh, so that's why they don't do it on a weekly basis. They'll do it only four times a year. So this is where they really dig in deep into like every part of the country. Uh, and the reason for this is in part the big ad sales events are come just after the sweeps. Like just after the May sweep is the upfronts in New York and Miami where they sell $8 billion of television advertising. And stuff. So they want the latest uh, accurate national uh, uh, ratings data in order to sell, basically. You know? And you can sell adequately as number two. You don't have to be number one. Um, another important thing here we talked about as an alternative to the diary system of recording what stations they're watching, 
right? Members of research panels that are, are you know, uh, the targets of ratings, uh, they have increasingly been equipped with this mechanical device. I'm sorry, it's like a little pager. It goes on your belt. Uh, and it listens for uh, high-frequency codes that are embedded in television and radio shows. And uh, it takes from those codes the name of the show that you were watching or the channel you were watching and the time that you were watching. And it communicates that back to Nielsen. So, uh, you know, continuing on with their tradition of the autometer, which was their little mechanical device that they had in your radio, and then they had set-top boxes, you know, on top of your TV. You push a button to, um, and now the PPM, which is this little listening device, which is supposedly super objective and hears everything that you hear and communicates that back to Nielsen if you're part of a panel. So, uh, so that's the cutting edge there right now. So it's, the challenges, of course, are that even with a PPM, um, Nielsen works by what's called doing a survey, right? And that is different from a census. So the census would get data from every single American, and that's what the national census is supposed to do. Uh, the survey technique is you try to get from, you know, let's say 2000s households that use television in the country, you try to then extrapolate that out into a picture of all of the users. So that you know, a, a, a sample survey type of method um, is gonna is gonna require a, an estimate, and the estimate has to accurately reflect the population. So if you don't have enough African Americans viewers in your population here in your sample, you are not gonna represent adequately what's out of the country, and that costs money to stations that program to those different groups. You know, so. Uh, uh, Spanish language stations have sued Nielsen for being underrepresented in the in the uh, in the samples, and they've won. You know? So it's important stuff. Um, when we get to the internet, the geographic location is not as important as is you know the ability to have samples of individual users, and so. Um, Nielsen, of course, they can't compete as well as some of the online platforms like Google or Facebook, but Nielsen has their samples as well, and they try to track what people are doing uh, online on the internet and also on mobile phone as well. So they've tried to do their best to cover all of the uh, platforms and, and uh, media, but um, they, get, they get beat online by the big platforms. Which, you know, they, they do their own <laughs> ratings, basically. Facebook, Google, and stuff. So uh, it doesn't sound all that objective, does it? You let them, let them do their own ratings, but that's what they do. Right up. OK, then uh, back to broadcasting. We talked about the difference between ratings and share. Um, so uh, this is, you know, just explaining what a rating actually is. So the way that is calculated is basically you've got the number of impressions, which refers to the number of people or households that actually, they actually saw the show. So this is what you would expect when you're talking about ratings. It's like, okay, who saw you know, Big Bang Theory last night? And then if you put that over what they call the universe, which is the number of households that uh, could have seen the show. So the numbers, that are in the DMA. Um, that becomes your universe if you're a broadcaster. If you're a cable company, so it's broadcast. If you're cable, it's like everybody, the households in the cable system, you know, subscribers. So this comes up, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, you had a, a million national viewers. Uh, and you had a 10 million uh, universe in your cable system, you know, you'd come up with a 10% rating based on your cable system. It's literally put a million over 10 million, come up with one over 10 or 10%. So this is rating, right? And then share uh, refers to just uh, uh, rather than the universe being all of the households that could possibly have seen your show. 
Uh, it is instead all of the households that actually had the TV on that day. So, of course, in any DMA, not every household is tuned in. Um, so it uh, is going to uh, lead to a higher number, let's say, if, if our rating was, you know, a million impressions in a universe of 10 million households in that cable system, let's say on that given night, only 5 million people were tuned in using their cable system. Uh, so you'd have the same number of people were watching, a million people watched, but now if you're calculating share, you're only concerned with the 5 million that had their TVs on. So it would still be 1 million impressions because that's counted and projected, but now it's 1 over 5 or 20%. So knowing this, is which is most likely to be higher, ratings or shares? So for the same event, the same show, the same night, if we're calculating ratings or share, which one is likely to be higher consistently? The shares. The share, right? And the, the reason for that, it's not just because, you know, I wrote 20%, but it's also because on any given night, your entire universe will never be tuned in. It's always going to be less than you know the potential that you have. So that's going to give you a fraction with a smaller denominator going to lead to a higher, a higher number. So broadcasters love to give their numbers in terms of share rather than ratings because that sounds better, basically. Um, TV, if TV is done on a minute by minute basis, Radio's done what they call an average quarter hour because people change channels so much. Uh, ratings basically looks at, you know, remember our 15 minute hot clock? So they're basically looking at, okay, how many viewers did you have in each of these segments? And so uh, you might do really well in that average quarter hour. So they compete in 15 minute chunks. Uh, that's what AQH refers to and that's We're back deep in the thicket, so let's zoom out a little bit and get, just get through this and get to the Kahoot, because that'll give us the questions that we need to answer. Okay, definitely ratings don't explain why content is selected, because all we do is count the people who were sitting in front of the program and divide them into their various demographic groups. You know, the family is, uh, uh, you know, whatever, composed of a 15-year-old and a 30-year-old and a 40-year-old and such. So, but that doesn't explain why they watch the content. It just says they were sitting there watching the content, which is enough for advertisers. But there are other kinds of, um, of uh, research which fill in those you know, why questions. So they will you know, play music or they will play DJs and they'll say, well, why do you like this? And get more information based, based on that. Um, concept testing, you know, before they release a movie, they check if people like the end, for sure. Okay, more technicalities, cost per thousand, so CPM. So this uh, <clears throat> refers to what's the cost to reach 1,000 audience members in the medium that you're working in. So, you know, if it costs you 25,000 bucks to reach 1,000 people in, you know, what did I just say? <laughs> I'm so confused. If it, if it costs you 25 bucks to reach 1,000 people, your CPM is going to be $25, basically. Okay, so probably a better real example would be if you're trying to reach a million people and it costs you $25,000, then your CPM is still $25, right? You divide that by 1,000, so. Uh, CPM, just cost per thousand, and it's important because uh, people assess what media they should buy based on those costs. You know, there's, TV, TV CPM is about 25 bucks. And I think we looked into uh, recent you know, prices, but online is a lot less expensive to reach 1,000 people, uh, at least in terms of just impressions, right? 
um, Hale Television. Okay, so uh, where I think we didn't uh, actually explain anything was when we got to the internet last, uh, just before spring break. So here, you know, uh, the CPM can be calculated for a website uh, just as it could be calculated for, you know, a print newspaper or a television commercial or something like that. You can, you know, at your, at your most basic, you can uh, calculate your ratings based on how many hits come to your page, which is the equivalent of an impression, right? If someone's sitting in front of an ad and they watch it on TV, uh, it's pretty much the equivalent of someone clicking on a page and having that ad display in front of them on their computer, right? So, you know, the, the amount of hits you're getting directly correlates with the amount of impressions that you get for a television ad campaign or something like that. It just means somebody saw it, that's all, an impression, right? Um, then you get into more interesting variants online, cost per click. So CPC, somebody has to actually click on something on the ad on the page in order to uh, register as, you know, to count as in this type of rating. So whenever I make a mistake and click on a page by accident, I think, ah, somebody just made money and I really didn't care about that page, right? Uh, so pay-per-click is one way of um, charging people for ad cost per transaction. So you only pay if you actually buy something, so, um, and, or, I mean, if the client actually buys something, cost per impression or per thousand, that's what we're talking about in terms of hits, it's the equivalent of an impression, CPM. Time spent on a page is also an important thing, right? Um, uh, I think YouTube is probably from what I've been hearing anyway, they can give you very precise indication of how long people stayed on your videos. They give you uh, general ideas, you know, don't make your video over five minutes or something like that because you lose audience pretty quickly. But they can also show you exactly when people are leaving your videos and stuff like that. So they're tracking time spent with each, you know, video that's up there. Voila. So there are, you know, uh, those different variations which benefit from the interactivity of the internet. And then um, another thing which we'll see in the cahoots just in a sec, so worth explaining here, are ad exchanges. Um, so um, ad exchanges are kind of like, uh, they're, they're services that bring together different content providers and automate the ad sales that go on on those different properties, basically. So imagine, uh, you know, you're a blogger or you're involved in, uh, you've, got, you've got web pages, you've got uh, even social media, which, you know, promotes, I don't know, different fashion accessories, let's say something like that. Uh, if you have a sizable audience, you will either approach an ad exchange or sometimes they might approach you and say, hey, why don't you join our exchange? Basically, you sign a contract, we split the ad revenue, uh, we give you some software that you put onto your page, and your software basically talks to our servers and loads up whatever ads we decide to put in there. Uh, so we'll do all the selling. You just try to make the best content you can so people come to your pages. And uh, we'll split what we you know, uh, make from the advertisers with you. And this is the way the ad exchange works. And they could get literally hundreds of properties, hundreds of websites, blogs, anything, uh, signing up with them so that they can develop an audience of you know, many millions, even though none of those individual websites or blogs has a very large audience. So they're looking for a certain threshold, but after that, you know, you contract with them and then basically you become part of this giant audience that they can sell to advertisers. So it's a good way of small media kind of being grouped together to scale up and sell, you know, ads in that way. So that, that's one way that it works. 
So there's a question on that in the Kahoot and on the, the quizzes and stuff. Ad auctions is you know the other one that we're all familiar with, which is when you land on a web page, um, you know, there are a couple of different methods that uh, basically track your history of online, you know, what you're interested in, what you've been watching, stuff like that. Uh, those are right cookies, which you can now decline, but there are apparently more subtle ways that uh, that kind of tracking can still go on. Um, and uh, so cookies carry that data as to where you've been, what you've been looking at. And so there's a little exchange when you land on a web page between your browser uh, and um, the, um, the software, which is, uh, you know, sending out whatever content that you've been after. So it'll go get the cookie and find out, wow, you've been looking at a lot of sports sites. And then it'll conduct a little auction in the background. Basically, uh, people have made prior bids on what kind of audience they want. And if you happen to fit a certain profile, then the ad will be selected from all of their inventory and put onto your page in a split second. Like It's so fast, you don't even know what's going on. And of course, the biggest of these is Google AdSense, which will be using cookies, but also whatever it can glean from anything else from your Google um, account. So it scans your Gmail looking for keywords. Right? And it basically builds up that profile so that the advertisements, uh, auctions are based on that kind of information. So that's what leads to the spooky uh, targeting where it's like, hey, you know, I was looking for a car and then all of a sudden you, know, you get nothing but car ads almost instantly. You know? so, so that's basically how that works. Okay, any more? Whoa. Uh, you know, the other thing is just the something that we could all keep our eyes on, maybe for the industry news or something, you might be interested in just looking at, you know, the increasing uh, value placed on um, listener or audience engagement. So if they are spending a lot of time on your page or if they're talking a lot about your TV show on social media, uh, you know, uh, in old media, that didn't count for much, but in new media, it's increasingly important as to you know what um, what broadcasters or other content providers consider you know, important advertisers as well. Uh, what 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 they think is a good representation of what the audience is you know what they're after from an audience, it's not just people in front of the television now, it's also people actively communicating about it and, uh, you know, uh, participating in social media about, about this. Of course, um, yeah, that's, right now that hasn't eclipsed the old media rating system, but there's all kinds of, you know, pushes in that direction and thought leaders in the industry will be talking about that and stuff. So that's, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to a good, at least it'll be less boring than me reviewing the entire thing. I hope anyway. All right. So let's launch one. Guys, for participating. <laughs> All right, great. We're in. Okay, let's give it a start. Fifteen questions. Are we ready? 
Nielsen's autometer was first used to measure which of the following? Television station viewers, primetime TV viewers, radio and TV audiences in the 1950s, or radio station listeners in the 1930s? Good. Taking the wrong one. Okay, so the right answer is it goes way back to radio. So their audio audiometer was the the little uh, ticker tape that they put into your radio, and uh, it recorded where your dial was at. And then they, you know, kept going into TV. DMA stands for Dominant Media Area, Designated Market Area, Dynamic Media Advertising, Digital Marketing Association. Great. So yeah, the DMA, designated market area, the country is split into a couple of hundred of them. And that is, you know, that defines the marketplace where different television stations compete with each other, for instance, right? San Jose, uh, Oakland, and um, San Francisco would be our DMA. In a one million uh, television household area, COPS is seen by 150,000 homes. So what's its rating? So the universe is a million. The number of impressions is 150,000. So the right answer is 15, okay? So it would be 15% if we put, share instead of we put, ah, okay, there you go. Yeah. And I might ask you on the exam, I might like say, okay, what is, you know, I might switch it up. But let's basically look at this. If, I, if I've got 15 over a million, I can cut out four of those zeros, right? And I come out with 15 over 100. Right? So we know that that is 15 percent. So that's that's as as much math as I ask in that because that's about all I could do myself. So <laughs> radio station ratings often measures audience in terms of so we're talking radio, right? So they don't do it minute by minute. Awesome, good. So they do the average quarter hour, remember, because people are spinning the dial, so they just average out how many people are in that 15 minute segment. If a spot advertisement, so that's a TV commercial, costs $100 and reaches 1,000 people, what is its CPM? So don't overthink this. This one is very simple. What is its CPM if it costs $100 and it reaches 1,000 people? OK, so the right answer is 100. This is $100. So CPM is the cost to reach 1,000 people. So if I tell you, well, it costs $100 to reach 1,000 people, then the CPM is $100. Wait, I thought $1 was 100. Pardon me? Oh, it's yeah. pretty far away. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but the right answer is the hundred. Yeah. That's what I got. But... Okay, we won't hold it against you. <laughs> when Ford pays for oh, I didn't get to this because we already had so much to review. When Ford pays for half a local car dealer's advertising, it is known as. We actually had this question in the advertising uh, one too, so you would, have, you would have already seen this question before. All right, that's good. Cooperative advertising. Yeah, that's what that is. So that's where the national cooperates with the local dealer. Okay, Nielsen's PPM is. 
what does that stand for? Portable people meter, point of use personal meter, personalized portable metric, personal portable meter. It's like a tongue twister. So it, the PPM is the personal portable meter. Okay. All right, as we continue on. Diary responses can be inaccurate, but ratings based on metering devices fixed those problems. True or false? I can't remember whether this one is true. Or false. Uh, the logic behind this, I think, is that um, um, you know, uh, even with the PPM, we still remain with plenty of problems associated with either the underrepresentation of different demographics in the sample. That's the major one. Uh, so the other possibilities are, for instance, you leave the PPM in a place where you're not actually listening to anything. I don't know. You put it on a counter, and it starts listening to everything that you're not even there to listen to. So there are, there are still plenty of potential problems with the PPM. Um, on ad exchanges are most common in which medium? Which medium would take advantage of the ad exchange? Awesome. Yep. Sure. It's useful for the internet, right? Basically, other media already have their forms of, uh, of aggregating the distribution. You know, if you're in a cable system, it's the cable operator like Comcast that pulls together all the channels and then sells advertising on those channels. So during some kind of period, Nielsen sends diaries to sample homes around the country. So it happens four times. Oh, everybody got it. Sweeps. Cool. Ratings explain why viewers and listeners prefer certain programs over others. Red is true, blue is false. False, right. So they only tell us how many people are watching. They don't say why. Okay. Barring an unlikely event, shares are always larger than ratings. This one is true. Great. Which of these is an actual audience measurement challenge faced by, faced by online advertisers? Use of different metering techniques, different ways of counting website visitors, different means of sample selection, or all of these? So the answer was all of these, and maybe just as an explanation, because usually when I see a quiz with multiple choice and there's all of these, I'll, I'll likely choose that. Don't get fooled. But let's look at this. Um, all of this derives from the fact that Nielsen is not the monopoly in online measurement as it is in radio and television. So. In radio and television, although you know we're all pretty hostile to monopolies because we figure they can you know be inaccurate or you know and there's no price to pay because there's no competitors. But the advantage of Nielsen being a monopoly is that all of the media that they cover are covered in the same way. Online, there are many competitors to Nielsen, and because of that, each competitor does things a little differently. Nielsen will do it their way, Comscore will do it another way, and another service will do it another way, which leads to the numbers are never quite the same. Um, so, and the reason the numbers are not the same is largely because they they you know have different sample selection. So, like Nielsen continues to do their thing, 
which is get random samples generated through national telephone banks and stuff like that, which is a very expensive way to do it. But some of the other online services will gather their samples in you know different ways. They will you know put out advertisements basically saying you want to be part of our sample. They will then you know put a little bit of software that you download and leave running in your in your browser or something, and you agree just to constantly use that browser for everything you do. And so that sample is not as it's not generated the same way as Nielsen. Uh, you may, however, get a really interesting sample together of, you know, gamers, you know, people who, you know, if that's who you want to get, maybe that way of recruiting a sample is going to lead to a more interesting sample than Nielsen will do for you. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, a, that's the major difference, right? Uh, and then, you know, the way they count visitors or the use of different metering techniques is, it's all a part of it. Basically, it stems from there being no monopoly player online, which, you know, again, we could probably think that's a good thing, but in terms of just getting an easy comparison, it makes things more complicated. Which of the following is used to set online advertising rates? So we're talking online, that means internet, which means the interactive aspect, right? So click-through rates, caching, CPT. All right, well, good for you guys. <laughs> everybody got it right. We don't need to, well, almost everybody got it right. So hits, the number of times someone comes to your page, cost per click if they click on the ad that's on your page, CPT, cost per transaction, if they actually buy the item, then that's another way of working. Audience activity is more important than audience size in mobile or social media ad campaigns. Okay, so it is true. I mean, what they're more interested in in, uh, in terms of social media or online or sorry, mobile or social, what's important is how much time you actually spend with the item. Do you forward it? Do you like, like it and send it out to other people? That's what's going to be uh, most, most important for them. Um, impressions less so. OK, cool. Way to go. Who? Um, and uh, sorry for that $1 versus $100 mix up. Otherwise. There could have been different triumph on the podium. All right. Anyway, thanks for participating and playing the game, guys. Um, getting on into, um, I say, let's start looking at generation like. And because there's already been too much PowerPointing today, I think I feel that way. So uh, did everyone get one card? Yeah, you can. Get this. This is our usual, you know, fill this in for credit for the discussion. So this week is largely just uh, this discussion is entirely, not largely, but entirely just about this video that we can watch. And for those who are at home, you're welcome to watch it at home. Um, and just, you know, giving your, your impressions and feedback about some of the um, some of, some of the interpretations that are made and some of what we're seeing on the video. So let's just hope that this video is still online. It's always my terror is that this thing will be gone and I've told everyone we have to do this. Uh, yes, KQED is our local station. So we're, we're going to check out some of this and feel free to write comments today or if you want to see the whole thing before you actually comment on this. We'll be showing a little more of it next class. And one quick look before I go here, just to see how everyone's okay. Chat is quiet. Fair enough. Back to video. Back to video. And click and get to the player.
tonight on Frontline. It's all about likes. You want to be liked. I like. I like. I like. I like. The power of like. Companies know how to turn like into money. The kids who are like. I put it on my Instagram and I was so happy. I started getting views, which I didn't think was going to happen. This is my first fight with Lorraine Street and Taco. And the advertising machine spinning likes into gold. Your consumer is your marketer. This is the biggest transformation that we've had in our lifetime. If you don't have a zillion hits, then you generally wouldn't get noticed by a sponsor. Author Douglas Rushkoff examines the culture of like. A million people took an action to say, yes, I like that piece of content. That piece of content speaks to me. That's profound. The fame. They needed to stop worrying about their followers and start worrying about the money. The fortune. They can reach their friends and their peer networks and be your own evangelist. They can sell your product for you. And what it all means for the way we interact with each other and all the people and things we like. Tonight on Frontline, Generation Like. this event tonight because, you know, as parents, we're all going through the digital revolution with our kids. We have um, Douglas Rushkoff. I've been speaking at events like this for more than 20 years now. I've written books and taught classes about this stuff, so people turn to me for answers. What do you do in the case of extreme bullying? My son plays a game it's called StarCraft. How much does that show up in track? I don't whatever. think it's going to affect the kid's whatever. job. For but lately, I've been wondering, are we all asking the wrong questions when we focus on the technology itself rather than what's behind it? Kids are spending more and more of their time in digital spaces that they don't have even a basic understanding of what they are, where are they tilted, what are they for? The problem as I see it is what are companies doing to our kids through technology and how can they and we be made more aware? Technology is here to stay and it's changing all of our lives, especially those of our kids. But how? What do these websites and apps really allow teens to do? What is it they ask in return? And are kids aware of any of this? It hasn't always been like this. When we made the Frontline documentary Merchants of Cool back in 2001, the media environment was quite different. Hey, what's up? We're Limp Biscuit, and you're watching TRL if you didn't notice already. MTV was the mighty behemoth growing rich, exploiting kids' desire to be cool. Can I take your picture for a street culture website I work for? Corporations were chasing kids down, taking teen culture and selling it back to them. This isn't kind of neat. The other day, who got like 50 90 favorites. favorites. Yeah, 90 favorites. Like, Malcolm, yeah, Malcolm. Today's teens, like this group of high school friends in Montclair, New Jersey, don't need to be chased down. They're putting themselves out there online for anyone to see. They tell the world what they think is cool, starting with their own online profiles. Are you need a profile picture or a cover photo? I don't know. You want me to do it? But you can't have a cover photo by yourself. Listen to Jenna. She's the master of Facebook. No, it's an example of a Come on. We're trying to get 400, get 400 likes on your profile picture. <laughs> a profile picture is kind of like how you want people to visualize you. You put your best foot forward. Yeah. Um, and your cover photo kind of tells about your personality. Okay, guys, do you think Darius should do this picture on there? That picture as his profile picture? Yeah. I vote no. What is it you would want the profile to accomplish? You wanted to show the true Darius. And <laughs> I mean, usually when you think of Darius, he's always smiling, he's always a happy guy to be around. So. <laughs> so cute. Uh -huh. So it's this one? Yes. Yeah, it's really cute. And we found a photo of when he's like smiling and being yeah. true, his true self. Is it true you now? My, my profile is definitely a true me now. <laughs> definitely true me. Compared with the kids I met 13 years ago, this group seemed so sophisticated. What's your caption going to be? Nothing. Nothing. You didn't put anything up. Uh, 
But as they sat there doing a virtual makeover on their friend's profile, they revealed a vulnerability. How did you get almost 400 likes on your profile picture? Exactly! Likes. You were kind of surprised it hurt, the high number of likes? <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Is three, three, 400 I, is a lot? For example, oh. we just posted a, a picture of me, the, my new profile picture, and I got like, 14 likes. Boys get less than and, girls. Yeah, and and yeah in 20 she, minutes, though. Yeah, yeah, but she had 300. Likes, follows, friends, retweets. They're the social currency of this generation. Generation like. The more likes you have, the better you feel. You can't wait to find out whether people like you or not, so you need likes and stuff like that. Instant gratification. You get them, you give them, and everyone knows how many you've earned. The number's right there for anyone to see. Are the likes you get, are they about you or are they about the profile picture? That's yeah. how you sit in front of your computer for an hour trying to figure it's it out. Cryptic. There's no way to know. <laughs> it's very cryptic. And when a kid likes something online, a product or a brand or a celebrity, it becomes part of the identity that they broadcast to the world, the way a T-shirt or a bedroom poster defined me when I was a teen. For kids today, you are what you like. I liked Urban Outfitters. Under Armour. Fanta. Joke Pages. Nike. McDonald's. Twizzlers. Pita. Sony. Drake. Too many to name, really. <laughs> Kaylee Lynch of Mount Vernon, New York, likes The Hunger Games a lot. This is like my number one kind of thing. Like I obviously, I like other books and I like other fandoms and stuff, but not as much as The Hunger Games. Like that's my top one. <laughs> yeah. Her Tumblr blog and Twitter feed are filled with pictures and links to the billion dollar franchise. And I've been a fan of the books ever since I was younger. Like when they first came out, I found out about this website and I saw that they were having like these little contests on it. So I was like, oh, I really want to win these contests. <laughs> The Hunger Games is about teens forced by adults to battle each other as a form of public entertainment. I'm gonna kill you. Being a fan isn't so different. The movie's official website allows kids to compete with each other for virtual prizes by sharing its content on Twitter. It's called retweeting. And when it comes to The Hunger Games, Kaylee's among the most prolific in the world. It's like an accomplishment, like, it's just really cool to be able to like think of yourself as like one of the people that likes The Hunger Games the most. Being one of those people who loves it so much that it's like you're one of the top fans. So there's a way to almost verify your yeah. centrality. It's like, it's like a way to show people like, yes, I am one of the top fans. Actually, look at the website. More than any generation before them, today's teens can speak directly to the artists, celebrities, and brands they like. And sometimes they get a reply. A couple of the other actors and actresses from the first movie have noticed me. Jack Quaid, who played Marvel from District One. He was like my favorite actor. I don't know why, but I just became super obsessed with him. So I was like tweeting him, like, my only goal anymore is to get you to tweet me back. And he tweeted me like, oh, go check it off your list. Now go save the world and hurry. So that was really, really cool for me. Does that motivate you to share things in the hopes of them kind of noticing? Yeah, I mean, I've tweeted them a bunch of times, like hoping they'll retweet me and stuff. Because it's really cool, like, them noticing you. It's cool because when a kid likes something and that thing likes her back, other kids notice. And then they like her too. The Hunger Games official Twitter, they retweeted me and I gained like 60, 70 followers. It's kind of, you know, self-empowering um, to know that like, oh, I'm one of like top fans on their website. Empowerment. It's a word you hear a lot when kids talk about social media. I think that social media really has empowered me. It's a way to let people know you're there. Definitely gives me a voice. Show my talent to the world. Broaden who you're talking to. They'll just post whatever they're feeling. There's no one there that's saying, you cannot, you can't say that. Once teens have created online identities, they have an array of tools through which to express themselves to anyone interested enough to listen. Hey everyone, it's Tyler. I'm a vlogger on YouTube. I got in trouble because I don't have a filter on my mouth. I talk about my life online. That's what I do. I went to an ugly sweater party. 
But I've been doing it since 2007. I had just gotten my first laptop and I discovered YouTube. I just wanted to do a really quick update while I'm at home doing my laundry. I had just gone off to college, I was 18, and my three best friends went to three different schools. And so I had like Facebook to keep in touch, um, but I also wanted to keep in touch in my own little way. I noticed one thing about my new haircut. Um, it does this optical illusion called humongous forehead syndrome. And I remember one video had 100 views, and I was like, I do not have 100 friends. I wanted to say I'm so thankful for all the new subscribers. I mean, the numbers go up and up and up, and I can't... I have made probably over 500 videos just talking about everything. How cute. Well, not everything. Just the things he likes. This one's got the untold story of One Direction. Girl, we are in for a treat. Like Kaylee and her Hunger Games, Tyler Oakley is obsessed with pop culture. He's Kaylee on steroids. I absolutely adore these two bow ties. And social media lets him share his obsessions with the world. Oh, hey, welcome to my room. If you were to, like, go hog wild about somebody or put, like, One Direction posters all over their wall. I really, I have no excuse for this. People might, like, look at you weird, but on the internet, like, people are, like, all about it. And guess what? Getting people to be all about something is big business. Major corporations have long spent billions trying to get kids to engage with their products and brands. Introducing Oreo Big Stuff. Now that the way kids consume media has changed, the companies that want to reach them know they need to change too. The icons of this generation are the like button, the tweet button, the reblog button. I mean, this is the biggest transformation that we've had in terms of communicating with consumers in our lifetime, in our lifetime. And so to not learn how to participate in those channels is outrageous. So to stand on the sideline is not an option. As a corporate marketing executive, Bonin Bao understands that when kids like something, it becomes part of who they are. And if kids want to express themselves by advertising his company's products, like Oreo cookies, he's happy to oblige. The strategy was to reimagine pop culture through the eyes of Oreo. We called it Daily Twist. Take the issue of same-sex marriage. If you're in favor of it and want the world to know, Oreo is there to help. Here, this platform gave something as simple as a cookie, a cookie, a cookie, which is, you know, two chocolate and, and cream in the middle, the ability to have a perspective on culture that was so profound. Oreos are gay. That one post alone had a million likes. A million people took an action to say, yes, I associate with that. I like that piece of content. That piece of content speaks to me. That's profound. Those are big, big numbers. And those numbers are extremely valuable. There is right now a huge, huge commercial push or corporate push to collect as much data as possible. When you hit like, when you retweet, when you make any expression online, you're creating data. You're creating a demographic profile of yourself. Everybody go like my profile picture. Everybody go like Darius. When Darius's friends like his profile picture, Facebook sees who he interacts with the most, information that would be valuable to advertisers. When Daisy likes dozens of brands on Facebook, those brands can learn more about a potential customer and all her friends as well. When Kaylee and her friends retweet news about the Hunger Games, the movie studio is able to track the response in real time. When Tyler goes on YouTube in search of the things he likes, YouTube, which is owned by Google, can track his every move. This is where the currency of likes turns into actual currency. Companies know how to take that data and turn it into money. The people who are handing over the data because they're hitting I like this or I like that, or they're telling all of their friends, will you please come like me? They have no idea what the value of that is. So all those selfies you take so that people will like them on Instagram, they helped that company sell for a billion dollars. Send a tweet, and you help raise the value of Twitter to around 30 billion. And Facebook, it's valued at around 140 billion dollars. Those numbers aren't based on profits, not yet anyway. Those prices are based on the volume of likes they can generate. And likes don't generate themselves. That's why companies need kids to stay online, 
clicking and liking and tweeting. How do they do that? By giving kids a chance to be a part of the game. Fame by association. You may not be as famous as Taylor Swift, but your photo can be part of her promotion for Diet Coke. Ladies and gentlemen, show some love for Beyonce. Send Pepsi your selfie, and maybe it'll be included in this intro to Beyonce's Super Bowl halftime show. Reach out to any celebrity or brand on social media, and there's an implied promise they might reach back. Bam, there I am in the commercial. That's like literally a check off the bucket list. Tyler Oakley is proof that it works, at least for the skilled liker. Like, oh my gosh, I am so excited for Lady Gaga tonight. His success in this game of likes is reflected in his numbers. Darren, Chris, stop it. After seven years of talking about his obsessions, he's won over three million subscribers to the YouTube channel he created. I don't know how it happened. It just happened out of the blue, and it happened like without intent. And I think a lot of what I did was just talk about what I love, and people gravitated toward it. And it's opened up a lot of opportunities, and it opened up a lot of doors. I felt so VIP official with like my lanyard. He's covered MTV's Video Music Awards on Twitter. I am so excited. I wish you were all here with me. He's a frequent guest on a pop culture show on YouTube. When I like fangirl about things, I think people really relate to that. And when he went to see One Direction in concert last summer, Tyler, 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 Tyler. Tyler Oakley, professional fan, had quite a few fans of his own. The interesting thing about traditional celebrities and then YouTubers, for a, a fan, they run up to me in the street and they're like, they act like we are friends. Part of the, the reason why a lot of people like relate to me is that I am just one of them. Oh, hey girl, come on in. Well, but he's friend. not real. Beyond his massive following on YouTube, he has over 800,000 followers on Facebook, 1.3 million on Instagram, approaching 2 million on Twitter and the numbers are rising every day. Tyler is a millionaire in the currency of likes. I can upload tomorrow? Yeah, I can upload whenever. whenever. But social media is all about sharing, and that includes sharing the wealth. When kids with large audiences work together, everyone benefits. Well, hello everyone, my name is Tyler Oakley, and I am here with... Holy white! Uh, my favorite thing to do on my channel is like collaborations. Christmas gives me like anxiety. Like, all of us YouTubers are realizing, okay, there's no point in not wanting to help all of us be successful and all of us rise together. I think you have the better ones. Here's how it works. Tyler does a video with Ollie White, introducing his 3 million subscribers to Ollie, who has just 300,000. Hey guys, so today I am with Louise. Hello. Ollie does one with Louise, who has a million. Boop, boop. I am here with Hannah Hart today. Hello. Louise brings her audience to Hannah, who has 920,000. You met Shane Dawson, Jay. Hannah is very happy to work with Shane, a comedian and musician with an astounding 5.4 million fans. And Shane shows up in a video with Liam Horn. You probably don't know Liam yet. He only has 45,000 subscribers, but that's going to change. Oh, yeah. Liam isn't trying to be a YouTube personality, though. He's a relatively unknown musician hoping to make the big time. To do that, he's turned to a new kind of company called The Audience. Okay, let's pull it up. Let's see the 10th, for instance. It's a talent agency, publisher, promoter, and network rolled into one. It's the brainchild of Oliver Luckett. Oh, good to see good you. To see you. What we do here at the audience is we run a publishing network. What we do is we basically run the social media on behalf of entertainers and artists and musicians and actors, and we help them express themselves inside of this medium. How many days of shooting was it? It used to be that if a kid didn't have good connections, hard work and talent was the only path to fame. Oh, and even awesome. that was no guarantee. But today there's another route. Build and leverage a social network. 
the piece that you did with Shane Dawson. I mean, that's got two million views in right, two yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And suddenly, and you read every comment on your YouTube, they say, you know, Shane brought me here, but now I love you. Yeah. And now I want you, you know, now yeah. I want to know yeah, more about you. Crazy. Wow. Well, what they're doing right now is kind of the job of a, what a record company would do for me. Like, they're building my fan base for me and helping me with media stuff. Sawyer Hartman showed up. Mm -hmm. He was, like, really cool. Sawyer uh, came. the big YouTube king? Yeah. Yeah, he's got, like, half a million followers, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Ain't nobody nowhere fresher than my chair. Liam has genuine talent, but it's almost beside the point. To get ahead, he needs to attach himself to others who have mastered the game of likes. Kids like Acacia Brindley, who has over a million followers on Instagram. She's only in the video for a few seconds, but she's a critical part of the marketing plan. Okay, let's, we'll, we'll look at it more and talk about it in the next class, I guess. It's feeling kind of dated, but it's also really kind of horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, have a good Tuesday. If you want to turn it in, I'm happy to receive Thanks. your comments so far as well.